Seth Greenberg is here. I was so happy to have Seth here. Welcome, Seth. How are you? It's David Sampson. Doing great. Any better? I couldn't stand myself. Flight got in a little bit late last night. Didn't get a whole lot of sleep. My wife still hasn't gotten here, but uh, life is good. It's the Final Four, man. It's the NCAA tournament. Go Championship week, NCAA tournament, Final Four, and the Masters. Life is good. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you were flying out of New York. I was last night, and I sat on the tarmac for four hours because of the storms back east. Brutal but I was not going to miss an opportunity to sit in the chair and talk to you. Final Four is coming up, but the focus has been a little bit on the women's Final Four and on Caitlin Clark, but the thought of Connecticut repeating, what's the lead? What's your lead to get people more excited about men's? Because for the first time, the women's actually get in prices more. Well, the, the price is more because there's only 17,000 seats. There's 70,000 seats for the men's tournament. Supply and demand is love the math. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, an economics major. I'm a broadcast journalism <laughs> major, but <laughs> supply and demand is something that really exists in every aspect of your life, whether it's a coach, a player, or seats in Final Four. Uh, look, what I'm, look, we we've got an amazing Final Four because we have great storylines. You know, we've got Purdue. Everyone was waiting for them to crash and burn all season long. Crash and burn. Out ah, of backcourt's not good enough. Fairly Dickinson, St. Peter's. You know what? They're here. You got Alabama, analytically driven. You know, 11 years ago, Nate Oates was a high school basketball coach. Now he's coaching the Final Four. They play like at a breakneck speed. They're going to shoot a zillion threes, and they're playing against the defending national champions who lost five of their top eight scorers and three guys to the NBA and have absolutely dominated the tournament so far. And then you got NC State. I mean, come on now. You got DJ, but yet you got the DJ spinning the hits. DJ Burns, DJ Horn. DJ Burns has been a phenomenon. They changed their style of play. They won their last nine games after losing five in a row. Uh, Michael O'Connell went from playing 20 minutes a game to 30. Well, he's played the most minutes of anyone in the final four in the NCAA tournament. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many good storylines. Uh, it, it's going to be an amazing final four. It never, it never disappoints. It never Story's disappoints. Great, uh, and great storylines. Seth, I've been thinking about something as it relates to NC State and a lot of press, an 11 seed. It doesn't happen often, only a, only a handful of times. And I'm wondering with now one and done, NIL, the transfer portal being as full as it is, in, in UConn trying to repeat, these stories are actually related. The difficulty in repeating, having lower seeds, do you think that will become more common now because the playing field really is more level than it's ever been? For another year, that COVID year levels the playing field. I mean, you're playing against guys that are 24, 25 years old, some teams. I mean, they're rebuilding their rosters through the, through the portal. And uh, if you get the right collection of guys, like Kevin Keats has nine transfers on his team. Nine tra First of all, they're not a Cinderella. I mean, Cinderella is the story. But, I mean, they're from the ACC. They, to, to get to the NCAA tournament, they beat Virginia, the winningest program in the ACC over the last 10 years. They beat Duke. And they beat North Carolina. Right? And then they went into the tournament, and you look at their journey to, in the tournament. So, look, they're an ACC program. They struggled early on. They found their identity. They backed off their defense to the half court. They played through D.J. Burns. It's a great story. I, I, I say it all the time. I grew up uh, in Long Island, played in Long Island. I was born in Queens, grew up in Long Island. And Jimmy Valvano lived one town over from me in Seaford, Long Island. His dad used to wreck my basketball games, Rocky Valvano. All right, he actually gave me a T1 game. I didn't deserve it. I promise you, I didn't deserve it. <laughs> what but, did you do, but, Seth? Uh, I probably said something I shouldn't say. Okay. But anyway, I can, I can see Jimmy V up above going, <laughs> here we go again. Here we go again. You know, I mean, that's just the way Jimmy was. And, that, you know, it's a great story. But, uh, you know, the – the, the run to the Final Four has been amazing. The run through the ACC tournament five games in five days is probably as amazing. I'm not sure that we've ever seen that. Have we, gentlemen, seen five? Jerry Mack. Wins? Jerry Mack. Because to me, it, Jerry we, it was so unlikely to happen. Right, but we didn't make the final. Yeah. I went to Syracuse, Seth. We didn't make the Final Four that yeah. year. No you, no, you didn't make the Final Four, but right. just the whole idea of what they went through right. on winning, that run. Was yeah, amazing. winning five in a row to win Big East, right. So when I'm thinking about the Final Four, I think from a story standpoint, you want to see NC State win, make the final game, and you want to see Connecticut because you want to have a chance of repeat because then you can't go wrong. Right. But the best part about a Final Four is when it doesn't matter who wins, that either way it's a compelling matchup. And I think that's where the men are, Seth. Yeah, I'd like everyone wants to see Zach Eady and against against Connecticut. I mean, you know, Zach Eady, the immovable object, uh, you know, their story is great. Is it Virginia 2.0? I mean, that's kind of a big question. That's right there. That's 
for the guys that people that say that Zach Eadie's just big, that play right there, that block at the end of the game to come off the weak side and make that block to secure the win for Purdue, this dude can flat play. He runs the floor. He can defend ball screens. He can score over the shoulder. He's really good. But that play, that is a great picture right there. Is he giving someone a finger? No, he's not. That's the boy, sir. <laughs> no, we do that on the show here, but only when Rich is away can we give anyone the finger. But we'll stick with the pointer. When you're coaching and you're coaching Final Four game, are you focusing on your surroundings to get to the final game? Are you saying we're happy to be here and that you're focused only on the one game? How do you take away the distraction? That's something when I was running a team that was so important, trying to get the players not to be distracted by ticket requests, by family being around, by all the hoopla around it. What do you do? Because these are kids, even though we don't treat them that way. Well, first of all, they're no longer kids. They're, uh, you know, they're very wealthy employees. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, NIL is not NIL. It's pay for play. These collectives are out of control. But having said that, uh, Terry Holland, when I was an assistant coach of Virginia in 84, Terry, I remember him. Uh, first of all, you take care of all the ticket requests and family situations well in advance. Before you get on that plane to get to Phoenix, that's taken care of. You'll give a little bit of family time, but it's routine, 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 routine. Uh, the biggest thing is, the day of the game, I still remember this as vividly as possible. I'm sitting there in the locker room. I, I, I actually had that scout. I gave the scout a report. And then Coach Holland steps up. Said, you know, we final words. And he said, it's not enough to get here. He said, you'll never hurt more than you've hurt in your life after a game. That if we walk in this locker room at the end of the game, and we know we didn't do everything humanly possible to have a chance to win this game. It's an empty feeling walking off that court, not getting a chance to play again and play in the championship game. And like, it was the first time, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going like, here we're in the final four. It's a great accomplishment. We were similar. We were, I don't know what seed we were. I mean, we were, we lost in the first round of the ACC tournament. We weren't very good. We had Othell Wilson, Tom Sheehy, Olden Palomis, Jimmy Miller, a really good team. Rick Carlisle actually was on that team, coach of the Pacers. And it, at that moment, it hit me like you're walking out that door, you know, the final four practice with 40,000 people there. That's great. You know, the, the, the police escort when you when you land, that's great. But we're here to, to get something done. And that's why I like Connecticut in this thing, because they, I go over there and watch them practice all the time. The standards, the standard. Danny Hurley is Saban-esque. He wow. he holds anyone and everyone accountable to the standard. Everything they do in practice, everything they do in film, every whether it's skill work, whether it's concept work, whether it's defensive stance, whether it's closeouts, whether it's five on four or four on three, whether it's ODOs, which is offense, defense, offense, no matter what, there's a standard to what they're held to. And if they don't fulfill that standard, he just goes, stairs. Do you and drop and just and, and the coaches have to have to do this, run the stairs with the players? Do you drop a Saban esque often? That is a no, quite no, a compliment. No, no, yeah. What no, other he, coaches he is have that? Izzo, Saban esque, been you know, and a similar thing about Saban worked at Michigan State. Obviously, Tom is is Michigan State. Uh, I think Izzo is probably the closest one to that. Uh, everyone coaches in their own personality. Danny coaches in his own personality, and his players love him. I sat in their film session after the Creighton loss, before we did college game day. We did a piece on on Danny, and I, like I said, I, I go up there all the time, and uh, that was a brutal one hour film session. I can tell you that. I mean, like the paint on the walls gone. It was brutal. All right, and it was real, and it was honest, and and he had some slides in between to kind of lighten it up a little bit. At the end of the film session. He has a way to bring those guys back. Say, all right, now we're cleansed. All right, you know, we understand. And then he, he was going to one of those deprivation tanks, you know, where you lay in. It's like, it, he goes, now I'm going to go get butt naked, put my headphones on, <laughs> and be at peace for an hour, and I'll be ready to go tomorrow. And those guys were laughing their asses off, jumping up and down, hugging them, high-fiving them. And I'm like, oh, he just killed him for an hour. But he has a, he has a gift. He's real. I mean, like Danny Hurley, there's nothing fake about him. You know about his journey. There's nothing fake about him. He's as real as real can get. He coaches him every day. He loves him up the same way. 
uh, and he takes those shortcuts. You know, when he goes to the portal for a specific reason, you know, it was Tristan Newton a year ago. It was Cam Spencer this year. Uh, you know, there he he wasn't afraid to redshirt Alex Caravan. He brought Donovan Klingon along. Uh, they've got an eight man rotation. One one guy that's probably going to be a lottery pick uh, besides playing in that Stephen Castle, a freshman who's just a lockdown defender who is not spoiled by the process. I mean, it really is. It's fun to watch just how they do things and what they do. So is he going to get frustrated like Saban with the new rules in college? Because when you say Saban S, the first thing I thought to myself is, well, then he's not long for coaching because with the changes that have occurred in college, Saban basically said, Peace out. I don't want any part of this. And he articulated that. Have you heard any of that around Hurley? No, no. See, it was different, different uh, time in their careers. I mean, you know, Danny Hurley is not even 50 yet. Obviously, Sab- Saban was at the end of his career. And, and Danny Hurley's smart enough to know, look, I, I mentor a bunch of coaches. and I, I have a lot of guys that have been in this business a really long time. Like, NIL and the portal is part of the business now. Just like recruiting is, just like uh, – scheduling is just like practice preparation is like just like going to booster functions at the end of the season when you go on those tours like when i was virginia tech and the season ended you went recruiting and then you went to all these booster functions the hokey tour and you know four days a week you were on the road you know shaking hands kissing babies and eating really bad chicken but uh it was part of the job well part of the job right now is embracing your collective part of the job right now is cultivating the people that can give to your collective uh, because like it's hard for a booster to say no to a coach. It's easier for a booster to say no to an assistant athletic director. So it's it's hosting functions at your house. It's being uh, getting people behind the curtain and giving people access to you uh, in a different way. It might be giving a speech to someone's business. You know, there are a lot of things that are involved in it. But uh, you either have to embrace it and buy into it and understand this is just the job that you've decided to take, and, and that's what Danny's done. I mean. He doesn't live in the portal. He's not bringing seven guys in the portal. He's bringing a piece in. But the NIL had look. We have to. We have to. We have to find a way to figure this thing out. There's no transparency. I mean, you hear the numbers. I mean, AJ Store talked. His, his mom's running his second transfer. We're starting at a million dollars. You know, I guess allegedly Kansas countered with seven fifty, and and they said no. He said, well, that's that's our best offer. The guy averaged fourteen points a game on a team that. You know, didn't win a game in the NCAA tournament or won one game in the NCAA tournament. I mean, like, we're out of whack. There's got to be transparency because you, you've got these runners that you are – well, they're agents now, but they used to be runners. And they're trying to set – they're trying to set basically uh, the the bar for what people – players are worth. And it's 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 kind of out of whack. Uh, and it's but it's not free agency, Seth. That's what everybody wanted. Well, I, uh, it, it is – whoa, it's free agency. All right. NBA, they have free agency? They have a form of free yeah. agency. It is not right. straight every, free agency. Every year? Is, it, is it every year? I wish it were. Yeah. I wanted that in baseball. The players would not allow it. I would love well, everyone wait, wait, to be a free you agent want every a year. year to year? Every single year? Every you know year. It, it, that, it's, it's impossible to manage. It's, it, it, there's got to be transparency. Here's what college basketball needs. I'm going to fix it in two seconds. <laughs> Two-year contracts. On those contracts, you have a set, basically, base salary. And then you have incentives because we we forgot to talk about education. Education has gone out the window in college athletics. It's gone out the window. So you have an academic progress incentive. You've got a GPA incentive. You've got a graduation incentive. You've got a community service incentive. All right. You've got all those incentives. And you know what else you're going to have in there? You're going to have a buyout like I had. When I went from Long Beach State to South Florida, I had to pay. When I went from South Florida to Virginia Tech, I had to pay. You want out? That's fine. Pay to buy out. But you would or just negotiate to get to more out. from where you're going, more than your buyout. All buyouts are is they uh, set the bar of what you need to leave. Yeah, but, but buyouts also pay back to the institution that you're leaving that invested in you, which enables them to go get the next coach or the next player. And I like, care's the deal. I mean, so you play for if you if you sign to your contract, you're number one, you want to leave and you've got a half million dollar buyout. All right. There's a cost of doing business. I and think that like, there's. Yeah, you, you can leave. You know what? That that next school, if they're going to pay the buyout, so then they're going to pay you a million dollars and they're going to pay a half million dollar buyer. You better, you know, there's got to be something that we have some form of 
of responsibility. Because like ever since all the coaches can go anywhere they want. Yeah, they can. And there's usually a very hefty buyout. I paid over a half million dollars in buyouts, and I didn't make the money that these guys are making now. But you did it for a reason, I would assume. I did it for a reason to be the play at the coach at a higher level, or if there was a change of athletic director at one of my jobs, I, you know, it was a new AD coming in. I never worked like to work for a new AD. Uh, I'm you know, fascinated there, there by other Seth. reasons. If you if you think about what we're talking about from business standpoint, you said education's out the window. I would put it. Which is disgusting. It, it should never be that way, but I'm not sure that it was ever in the window, and we can debate oh, no, that. That's, I know I do know it. I know it was in the window because I did it for 33 years. Well, I know it was in the window. I know, I know the bridge I built for my former players that are now doctors and CPAs and lawyers and teachers and, and doing all. But you know what? Because ec- education was important to us. Like, I spoke to a, a coach the other day, all right? And I, I speak to guys every single day, all right? And it used to be, what's your major? You'll meet with the the dean of the school. You'll meet with the university president. We'll talk about role and playing time and style of play and fit, all right? You know what it is now? It's one thing. It's one thing. Money. And you know what? Here's what we're going to have. And and I I know I've gotten off target of the answer, but here's what we're going to have, you know, just to give you an idea. We're going to have a generation of guys that so so say say uh, I'll use Nigel Pack as an example. Nigel Pack's a nice player at Miami. Got paid four hundred a year the last two years. I think he's coming back. Apartment, a car. Not an NBA player. Nice player. Not an NBA player. Going to have to go overseas. All right, he's going to go overseas. You know how what the starter starting salary is going to be? Probably seventy thousand dollars. And if he doesn't play well, you know, let's take like just any player. If he doesn't play well, he'll be sent home. Because in Europe, if you don't play well, you get sent home. Like we're gonna, and you know, we talk about mental health all the time. That's mental health issue. We're setting we're setting young people up to fail because we've lost the value of education. We've lost the idea of building a bridge for people to cross to make sure when they take the ball away, they're going to be successful. Uh, we've we've lost a little bit of the fight to get through the tougher times to to instead just go. You know, and we see it. We see it in grassroots basketball. I don't like this team. I'll switch another team. I like it, and that's great. And people say, "Well, you know, coaches." Yeah, I understand that. You know, we've been when, dealing when I, with my that. My first coach, in, Seth. It's, it's 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 such a complicated conversation because in in baseball we're drafting kids out of high school, and it's it, you know we can pretend we're giving them skills, but majority of them are not going to make the big leagues. And even if they do, they're not going to be able to make a living, a permanent living. Yep. And they've bypassed college. So the way we make ourselves feel better. Where do they go back to? Where do they go back to? Well, we we fund a scholarship. So we actually allow the players when they're drafted. And TJ, I don't know. This was always interesting to me. The number of players we had to feed, mm-hmm. we would pay for them to go back to college once their career was over. Really, And so we had to reserve for that in our budget every year in case a kid wanted to go back to college, we would pay the tuition. How many kids over the years actually chose when their career ended to go back to college to get an education for free? What would be your guess? Every kid who got released? 10%. That is 10%. high. Wow. It One. got to the point where I stopped reserving Zero. for the college scholarship plan because it was easier to self-insure it. If we got a call from someone, hey, I wanna go to Duke. All right, we'll cut the check for 50 grand, go to Duke. And we would negotiate the semesters in advance. So I agree that education is an issue that has not been dealt with, but we're getting so far away from education. We wanna call these kids employees now. You said it when we started, Seth, that they're employees. By definition, if they're employees, as an employer, I'm not focused on my employee's education. I already went through their resume. I've hired them. I'm interested in what they'll do for me as an employee. Yeah, but here's the deal. There's got to be there's got to be a value of like the college experience has a value. And, and if, we, if we're doing that, we're cheating. We're, we're cheating these young people. We're just cheating. And that's just me. That's a guy that was a career coach that that that, that it was important to them. We're cheating them. And, and we're sending a bad message. And like, you know, it, it's like when I was in Long Beach State, uh, one, th- I, one thing I did every year is I went to graduation, even if I didn't have players graduating that year. Because Long Beach State back then, 
it was amazing. It was a university that had a lot of first generation graduates. All right. And it was like a cool thing to see first generation graduates. And then, you know, if you have a first generation graduate, the odds of, the, of that person's child becoming a graduate is really high. It's really high. So what? So you, we say, well, you know, it's no big thing. And those baseball players, you say, that didn't go back. Well, yeah, I, I, I give you a better idea. Go back and see what those guys are doing now. I have a pretty good idea. Someone convinced, someone convinced them to chase a dream. It's just great. You all want to chase a dream. All right. Someone basically, instead of like being a parent saying the stove is hot and, and being realistic, because the young people and the parents and parents are, are part of the problem still as well. They're going to listen, to seek out someone who's going to tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. I always said parenting is all about telling your kids what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Coaching is telling the players what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Well, we got four sets sometimes. of kids right now, employees or not, who are chasing a dream, and it will all unfold over the next four or five days. Seth Greenberg will be there. I appreciate that you took the time to be with us this morning, especially after tough travel. Thank you, Seth, and, and good luck this weekend. Oh, it's going to be a blast. Thanks for having me. All right, take care, Seth. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.